Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gill at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Mark Wilson, who is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Pittsburgh, a fellow of the Center for Philosophy of Science and a fellow at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His main research investigates the manner in which physical and mathematical concerns become entangled with issues characteristics of metaphysics and philosophy of language. Welcome, Mark. Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks. So thanks for doing this. So um, our conversation today is about your book, Imitation of Life, uh, Imitation of Rigor. Um, and um, you say in the book uh, up front, uh, I, I'll just read this. Uh, it's a quote from Oliver Heaviside. Uh, and the quote is, logic has nothing to do with it, either with the fact, the discovery, or its use. At the very same time, it must be said that a sufficiently profound study of the subject would ultimately lead to the logic of its laws as a final result. Uh, what I do strongly object to is the idea that the logic should come first, or else you prove nothing. So, so this is sort of the theme of the book. Um, you want to talk a bit about, you know, sort of the the, the big the, the the biggest message in the book. Well, um, yeah, maybe it, it's it's so in philosophy there are all sorts of ge general disquisitions on theory and the scientific method, yeah. and all, all that. And my own experience was this. Um, in high school, uh, well, my I have an older brother who is, is a philosopher, is five years older, and he would come home with college, yes, from college sure. with various yeah. philosophy books, the standard things, Quine and Hempel, the, the, the philosophers of that time, who still, their thinking still dominates the subject today. And uh, and they were all descendants of the so-called logical empiricists that influenced methodology in a lot of fields, hmm. uh, particularly in the fifties. Anyway, he would bring home these books, and I actually learned a fair amount of logic in high school. I, rather than having fun, I just read the books <laughs> my brother. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I went to a miserable high school and so mm -hmm. the science classes you just learn nothing from them <laughs> right. but yeah. then these textbooks they would talk about laws of nature but then they'd use examples i, I this is i'm not kidding this is an example um what was it phosphorus smells like garlic now i did <laughs> not think that that sounded like a law of nature <laughs> Right, right. You you have to know what garlic smells like for that sentence to make any sense. Uh, any sense. Right. And um, right. 
I know what garlic smells like. I don't know if I've ever smelled any phosphorus, but <laughs> anyway. Um, so I, 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 this, I went off to college thinking, well, finally, I, I'll be able to find out what real laws of nature are like. So I just took freshman physics, you know, which was, I guess, a reasonably good course. And it was just classical physics. So it started off with Newton's three laws of nature. Yeah. Well, yeah. those look kind of like the axioms that these guys were talking about in my philosophy of science books. Hmm. I couldn't. That action equals reaction seemed a little dodgy to me. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you state it like that? But anyway, yeah. but that was just week one. I did okay there. And then the next week, um, they turned to beads on a wire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And being a, a very good logical mind, I could not figure out um, what, how that possibly connected with what we learned in week one. You know, <laughs> I couldn't prove, you know. Yeah. yeah. And my instructor says, shut up, kid. You're being too... I don't want to hear that philosophy. Do your homework, you know. Right. And uh, so I did the homework, but I just felt completely at sea. Right. Hmm. And um, by the way, Neil Gupta, who you talked to a couple of, some time ago, yeah, started off in engineering and got some an answer like that about complex numbers, and that's how he got into philosophy. <laughs> yeah, I I can relate to that, Mark. Uh, I started off in engineering myself, and um, uh, I think I stuck with it, uh, went through graduate school and it took me, it took me something like 10 years to realize that I didn't really like engineering. Well, I like it fine. Yeah. And I suppose that in some sense, there is a brute wisdom to that kind of instruction. You, you know, it's sort of like you've got a big swimming pool and you got to jump in it and start swimming and right. get around in the swimming pool you know to some extent but anyway and, and the swimming pool is you know uh, very neatly um, uh, constructed appointed and all the lanes are very neatly marked so it, it, it is it's easy to swim in some sense well but i think there's a question of how those lanes are marked <laughs> so, and from the point of view of just logic, get, getting yeah. back to that, they're not logical connections at all. They're rather tremendous jumps. At any rate. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that sort of marked me for a long time, but always sort of made me curious. And uh, so gradually, just trying to be basically interested in language and how it works, but kept getting pulled back to actually these kinds of examples and learning some history of classical mechanics and so forth. Mm. And the thing that this book that you just cited, which is the one I'm trying to finish up right now, um, what I actually decided, it, it turns out that um, those very things that bothered me back in freshman physics, the blockage I couldn't see, yeah, yeah. Out to have greatly concerned Heinrich Hertz in the last years of his life. And he wrote this book called The Principles of Mechanics mm -hmm. that had to return to this. Well, the, the basic problem is how do you mix entities that you would model with points like the beads with things that you assign sizes to like a wire. Yeah. You have to get those guys working in combination. And that actually takes some trickiness, right? And Hertz had to deal with this problem that actually was creating great problems for a coherent understanding of what the conservation of energy required. And mm -hmm. in Hertz's mind seems to have been linked with whether it was possible to model electromagnetic radiation as waves in the ether. 
Right. And yeah. he, got, he kind of stuck because he didn't know these fundamental principles. Yeah, so it's a foundational issue, Mark, if I understand it. It's the foundational issue that, you know, the, the theories appear too prescriptive, too deterministic. They are all not, not all, all encompassing. Um, it, it might explain what is at hand, uh, but if you deviate a bit from it, uh, then those theories are not not really useful. Is is that the foundational issue? What what ex how how exactly? What is the biggest issue that you have in terms of science against philosophy? Well, all those issues that you just mentioned are real, but yeah. these are an issue of where you will get a pretense that things fit together. Yeah, and they don't really when you examine things kind of with a fine tooth comb. And in the case, it caused a lot of problems for Hertz about answering some actual practical things that he worried about. Yeah. So he sat down to straighten out these this mismatch between basically objects of different sizes, okay, hmm. and or rigid bodies and, and smaller entities, basically. I'm trying not to get into a lot of here. <laughs> Yeah, and but it turns out, and that that was a a form of the the problem that struck me. But it turns out it's like that proverbial little thread on a sweater. When you pull on it, everything <laughs> unravels. Right. Okay. So what I've the thing that's been very helpful to me in my thinking is some of the modern work in computer methods, uh, so-called multi-scale methods. Yeah. Right. Which is a source of great revolution in the ability to simulate materials. Right. 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 And the way those uh, you have to, in order to handle a complicated material on a computer, uh, you need to divide the problem into usually based on characteristic scale size. And you have submodels about if you have a piece of steel, what goes on uh, at the highest level, which you would model with continuum physics smoothly, what goes on at the grain level, what goes on and then below that, what goes on inside the grain with the dislocations and all that sort of stuff. So you have a sequence of submodels that are, work a little differently, but they communicate with each other, not by telling each other facts, but they send corrective messages to one another. And those messages are determined by so-called homogenizations. So what if you if if at a lower level the dislocations see a dislocation piling up on a boundary, it has the message it sends to the model above is not anything about the dislocations, but mm -hmm. a, a message like this material is going to become brittle, right? That's right. something the higher level model can understand. Yeah. Okay. So it's a question of finding a, a system of interlaced messages that can go between these scales, these different submodels. Right. And if you put these things in a loop and run it over and over again until you get a self-consistent matchup of so you have initial modelings, they get re-examined to see whether they hold, the assumptions hold at a lower scale, and sometimes you need a correction. If you yeah. can do that over and over again until you stop getting these corrective messages, then you will stabilize on a pretty good description of the material that yeah. takes account of its complexity at all sorts of scale levels. Okay, so it's a great architecture <laughs> for arranging how you reason about a complicated material. Right. Okay. Now on thinking about that, going back to Hertz and this problem about the bead on a wire, I think it can be better understood in terms of this kind of linguistic arrangement. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have the bead modeling at a kind of a lower scale. When you think about a wire, you say it's rigid. 
that's much higher scale information, right? Yeah. And you got to get those two guys to work together. And mathematically, they've done this long before um, uh, homogenization came along. They use Lagrange multipliers to connect level one with level two. Yeah. yeah. But the philosophy behind it is this communicate in, in, in units that the other model can understand. Right. Right. And so this, I think, is the actual answer to um, what was troubling Hertz, right? Mm -hmm. That we had the, you, you, the best way to understand what was going on in it is that with complicated materials, you want to work on different scales like this and get them to talk to each other. And you want to be trained in classical physics so that you can do these mishmashes of different forms of modeling, right? Right. So that now Hertz himself um, didn't see this. He thought, well, you have to straighten out these discrepancies and have just a uniform notion of completely straightforward theory that can be axiomatized. In fact, his, this book of his, The Principles of Mechanics, inspired Hilbert to begin his studies in the axiomatization of lots of fields, which... Um, so when I was flipping through your book, you know, I, I was looking for some way for a, a technologist, a scientist, uh, to, to understand this. And, you know, I was thinking, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, it's a bit like you have a, a bunch of islands and they, there is water, obviously, between them. Uh, but the scientist lives in the island, uh, doesn't necessarily have a need to go into the water. Everything sort of perfectly works in the island. But if you go up, and look down, you see a lot of gaps between them. <laughs> uh, is that is that one way to understand it? You know, the the stuff works in the island, but but not necessarily when you go to another island. Well, that's all true, and in other parts of my writings, I talk about this. The thing I'm particularly um, emphasizing here is almost the opposite. Hmm. Uh, uh, but this should be of interest, or at least I would hope, uh, to the computer scientists and, and applied mathematicians that devised multi-scale modeling. Yeah. Which they did to conquer what I, well, they sometimes called it, um, I think, J.T. Oden called the tyranny of scales. <laughs> yeah. So on your hypothetical island, if we have a complicated material, you know, you're trying to simulate a car part or something. Yeah. Uh, you've got a lot of layers inside that car part in that metal, you know. And things that can go wrong or right with the car to predict how it's going to behave in a crash. Ultimately, a full story requires attention to potentially all of these scale levels, right? Mm. But if you try to model that on the computer, your computer will be running to the end of the universe. <laughs> right. Because right. of a huge number of variables. Right. So just for practical reasons, you have to carve those back to a more manageable set. And they've mm. been tremendously successful in that. Um, and um, so I think that that, in some sense, though they may not have realized that they were engaging in philosophical thinking, but it is, it's what is a good way to compute something, you know, that involves an awful lot of factors that we can't otherwise handle, right? Yeah. And so these kind of computer architectures, uh, um, are, are tremendously helpful in that way. And it required philosophical thinking, even of a, of a high order. Lots of things in applied mathematics strike, strike me as like that. People are trying to solve some pro practical problem 
but they do it in some clever way that if you were an armchair philosopher, you would have never dreamed of. Right. Mm -hmm. so I but wanna, it's yeah. not complete. Huh? But it's not complete. That is, that is the issue. Well, but that model of completeness may, may be overblown. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me, I'll go back to where I left off Hertz. Yeah. He sort of assumed just naturally, and Hilbert and all these people, yeah, there are gaps here, there's something wrong. Let's clear up the, the, the conflicts and have a nice self-consistent formalism, and then we can write it down as axioms. Yeah. Now, studying things in axiomatic form is a very useful activity, right? Yeah. But when you do that, trying to make sense of classical mechanics practice, the things that actually make classical mechanics successful, you come up with something horrible. So Hertz's the mechanics he proposed is really goofy. <laughs> I mean, he was a great, very perceptive scientist, but just following that model of the complete theory, right? Yeah. Uh, led, but especially now, since because we have to go into quantum work, realms and so forth, we don't expect that classical mechanics should be a complete theory. Right. But what we do think that it can handle, should be able to handle, or a lot of, fairly well, a lot of the ordinary behavior of the objects around us. Right. Right. And that imperative to be practical and learn ways that'll get you to good results uh, so push you in the direction of well try a different sort of architecture right where mm -hmm. you the model of trying to get a complete answer is pretty close to <laughs> trying to get a computer to work with zillions of variables that it can't possibly handle you know yeah so so my view and i'm influenced by a lot of other great philosopher scientists from hertz's time like mock and smock that anyway that's how i think that i so i think that hertz's problem to really understand well to understand um this problem i had in freshman physics which i in the book called the mystery mystery of physics 101 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why is it doing these weird things? Right. Yeah. Well, this gives you sort of an unexpected answer, an answer I wasn't getting from my philosophy of science books. It is that in cases like that, that model of complete theory or single level theory is not the right way to approach a certain kind of problem. And that a competent physicist that I would have never been or engineer needs to learn that variety of techniques that correspond to be able to pick different submodels and linking them up. Hmm. But that that is that is problem specific. Yes. Right. And well, so, yeah. yeah. And so um, and again, correct me if I'm I'm under, not understanding this. So um, you can be practical. You can make very interesting, um, very interesting things uh, by applying clever tricks uh, to the problem at hand. Uh, but if you believe that is complete, then uh, that would be incorrect. Uh, is that is that closer to your thought? Well, the idea that you should seek completeness. Yeah of the sort you're talking about is sort of like the mistake Hertz made, right? Yeah. And it leads you into an unworkable direction, mm. you know? Now, I, the reason as a philosopher, a general philosopher, um, why I find this particular example interesting and why I think that the sort of philosophy that the engineers have brought to problems like this are helpful is that I think, well, I believe in, that language is sort of shaped by practicality uh, in an evolutionary kind of way, just like the way animals 
evolve according to environmental opportunity, right? right. And so if you take a notion like cause for force, but I think it applies to things like color, just these ordinary classificatory words, they can start off in life, use fairly um, coarsely, right? mm -hmm. but as improvements in just demands of performance become more um, extreme, then th there is a sort of natural shaping of the, the use of those words into sort of compartments or what you called islands. Right? Yeah that will need to link with each other and share information with one another, but they won't be part of the same land, land mass or they will belong to different scale levels to use the other metaphor here. Okay. Mm -hmm. This means that a lot of the things, the way we think about the world has this sort of hidden structure that we don't explicitly notice, but we learn to use, just like I was supposed to learn in Physics 101, <laughs> how to jump from one thing to another according to necessity, right? And so that the, that the, the use of a lot of trouble words that sort of puzzle us have to do with that they're actually, have been practically shaped by, they have been certainly, operationally shaped by practical circumstance to have this, this specialization, but with rules for connecting up with other specializations in a fruitful way. Right. Like, like in these computer architectures, right? And that we often don't notice those sorts of shifts that we make in reasoning, right? Mm -hmm. And so this means, contrary to most models, even that the linguists have of how the semantics of language works. This means you have to pay a lot more attention to inferential context and how messages get passed from uh, one thing we say now to something we say later and things like that. So that's, I think that's, it's my belief that loosening up our expectations on how language carries meaning about the world in this kind of computer science uh, based direction uh, can loosen up a lot of mis or a lot of preconceptions that um, yeah so going going back to heavy side do you know yeah. anything did you ever read no anything? no uh, I, I, <laughs> I I haven't done anything in this area mark yeah. Well, Heaviside was this very eccentric, self-taught British electrical engineer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and as part of, he had actually worked on original sources, but he was dealing with the basic differential equations of electric circuits. He, yeah. he was interested in, in telegraph wires. Well, those equations are pretty tricky. And he started doing the most outlandish manipulations, <laughs> right? So yeah. if, you, if you have DF, DT, he would multiply by one over DT on both sides of the equation. And all. <laughs> yeah. And, but by God, he would work his way out to absolutely correct solutions where they were, other people were stymied. Right. And... Yeah. That he called that his operational calculus, and the rigorous, rigorous of the folks at Cambridge University, in fact, wouldn't sometimes publish his papers, and this set him in a rage. And so he wrote all these wonderful passages that I quote frequently, complaining about uh, the rigorous who look the gift horse in the mouth and refuse his offerings and stuff like that. And, yeah, oh, and they, my, my the best heavy side complaint was, well, it's all on this thing. He said, "Yeah, th there has to be a logic to what I'm doing that I don't know quite what it is." 
I found these methods by experimentation, right? Someday yeah. people will, but it took until about 1950 before a very a very good theory of what was going on in heavy side was developed, and it's part of the history of functional analysis, which wasn't really available in his time. So it took yeah. very sophisticated math hmm. to figure out, my God, that heavy side really had cottoned on to something important. And these weird rules he had can be justified, but in a much more elaborate framework than you would have ever expected in the first place. Yeah, it's to me, Mark, um, there are there are two issues. Uh, the, the first one is the language issue that you talked about. Um, so that the words that we use um, evolved over time. Uh, we are increasingly in the artificial intelligence computer world, and we are co-opting these uh, these words and the existing language to mean something, and that potentially leads to a lot of confusion. I would think, right? Um, people might even have different meanings for these words. Um, so, so that is a separate issue from uh, Heaviside uh, doing all that uh, partial differential equations uh, with a, with a so somewhat simplified goal of reaching something that is very specific uh, and showing something that's very specific, but not necessarily uh, consistent with uh, with with uh, underlying logic, uh, aren't they sort of the two different issues, or you don't see them that way? No, no I see them as the same. Though the way you articulated the, the, the first half, uh, yeah, may, uh, may not have been what quite what I was saying. Um, yeah. There's a question of how computer scientists might appropriate words from pre-existing practice that I would haven't studied particularly. Yeah. Uh, but I was making a claim about ordinary language practices about how we use color words, right? Hmm. Or, or how in freshman physics we use the word force. And it is true that with force, when you analyze um, the practice from this, say, two scales point of view, you will see that force is sh shifting its meaning. And that's actually, Hertz identified that there was has some fundamental shift in how force works. Mm -hmm. uh, he identified that quite correctly. And, and people, a lot of people don't, under, he doesn't write that clearly, so <laughs> have missed the fact that he was absolutely dead on about that. But mm -hmm. then the curative, the cure for these things that just naturally occur in any kind of descriptive practice is to sometimes see a range of the, the what we'd call the logic. I mean, there's a logic in some, in their general sense of logic behind these multi-scale schemes, but it's not have this straightforward logic in the same sense that an axiomatized theory would have. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we want to have a notion of logic that's broad enough to handle these more diverse kinds of descriptive systems. And that's what has to be done with heavy side too. Yes, a more coherent logic was developed in 1950 or so by Laurent Schwartz and all those sorts of where you can more readily track the way information is being handled in the heavy side calculus, right? And when you do that, then you can correct some mistakes that, that, that calculus sometimes makes. Okay, so that you do want to have a study of the logic of information transfer, right? <laughs> but sometimes you can't do that immediately. You but heavy side is you first have to find out what there is to find out. That is, you have to map out a rough territory and, and find these sorts of surprising dependencies and then try to figure out what's going on. Why is this working? Right. And so 
Yeah. That, that's what I would recommend that we do for a lot of troublesome conundrums that you face in, in, in philosophy to approach them with this wider sense of first what architectures work well and then this more generous sense of being able to track the logic of how information is being handled in the in, in the reasoning scheme. But, yeah, but, I, if, but when that becomes complicated, heavy side is right, you first have to map out roughly what you're doing and notice these transitions. So I'm going to give my favorite heavy side quote. So he gets challenged. I, we don't understand the logic of your calculus. Mm -hmm. And heavy side re, replied, should I refuse my dinner if I do not understand the processes of digestion? <laughs> <laughs> so that's my attitude too. I mean, you have to start with sometimes mapping out this architecture. And philosophy yeah, is not tended to do that, so that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, I wondered, Mark, though, it's a bit of a slippery slope in the sense that um, if, if I'm given the status quo and I set out to find the logic for that, um, it, uh, you know, it depends very much on where I started, how I am progressing. It, it is, it doesn't seem, you know, really fundamental to me, meaning um, different people could travel different paths underneath that, couldn't they? Oh, yeah. Generally, like with the heavy side calculus, there's a number of ways to make it more rigorous. Right. If you favor doing X, you may make it hard to do Y, you know, or vice versa. And that just goes with the territory because we are taking something that is. You found out ways of doing things by practice. And I think this is what you've been sort of driving at. There will be gaps and so forth, or things even when you're wrong, and you want a deeper sense of understanding of um, uh, what's going on. Yeah. But that's hard to obtain. And basically, what I am recommending here is we need an expanded set of models for understanding some of these common sorts of behaviors. And I'm not trying to be universalist here. I'm just know a study a range of cases of just physical description where understanding the logic means first understanding the sort of messages between subgroups and all that sort of stuff, that recognizing that that's going on, and then trying to work out, well, what are the exact messages being sent? And then, th then you get a fuller sense of what the, the practice is capable of, right? But it's a, it's a very gradual process. And the people that figure out some of these strategies for useful language are remarkably clever. <laughs> yeah. it, it, is an, it is an improvement, but um, it doesn't seem to me that it, it's going to lead us to, uh, maybe we have different sort of different definitions for logic, you know, so I, I guess I am still sort of stuck on, uh, which I think I think you are trying to move, move me from, which is there is a truth somewhere in here. Um, and there is sort of foundational logic somewhere in here. Um, but that may not be true. If that were true, then any marginal improvements that we make to the status quo, granted its improvement, will never get us to the to that foundational truth. Uh, you are talking more like a philosopher than <laughs> I would in that kind of um, these are things that so-called analytic metaphysicians talk about all the time. But there are a lot of presumptions about the relationship of mathematics and mathematical language to the world that are kind of being assumed here. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Here we're after the truth about the world, but, the, but being able to state the truth, as you say it, in one mathematical, mathematized claim, uh, to the extent to which we're actually capable of doing it should not be taken as a dogma, okay? Yeah. So in fact, lots of modeling, mathematical modeling takes a range of genuine mathematical tools, but pieces them together, right? In effective yeah. ways, right? Um, yeah. That may be the nature of our ca mathematical capabilities, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there are things to worry about. So your average, your most normal function you're going to see in mathematics is an analytic function. Okay. Well, built into the notion of an analytic function is a very strong sense of internal rule. Right. So I, I have someplace, use an example. If you um, pour ink out of two separate bottles into a puddle, right? And you try to model the formation of that puddle with an ordinary function, you'll have this weird fact that by looking at the puddle on the left side, you can completely reconstruct what the puddle is going to work look like on the right side of the. Okay. But that's mm -hmm. if the two bottles are pouring ink independently, you shouldn't get that tie that kind of connection across the entire puddle until it settles into equilibrium, in which case waves of transverse from one side to the other, allowing the two sides of the puddle to communicate with one another. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So to, to keep, to break up this excessive descriptive strength that's built into the normal functions, you do have to introduce singularities and things like that. That's kind of the history of uh, modern differential equations to, to, you know, to break up some of these excessive uh, ma mathematics, giving you rules that are too strong to, to match the physical situation. Something, it's very loose here. No, no. But, so but anyway, I, so, there are questions that I do not know how to answer, and I don't think anybody could reasonably answer them now. To be not too, don't presume too much about mathematics' ability to capture what goes on in the world in one scheme, all you know, that encompasses right. everything. We may have to kind of uh, uh, piece things together to correct for these descriptive excesses. Yeah, so, so, so some of your desire from completeness would fall into this territory. Are you making assumptions that maybe you wouldn't want to make when you think about it? Right, right. Yeah, so so the, the descriptive excesses, as you as you call them, um, the, the more specific um, your apparent understanding is, or more, more specific the theory is, the more likely uh, that it is going to run into trouble in the sense that, you know, as you mentioned, singularities and so on. Um, we have sort of a similar problem, uh, Mark, in life science. Of course, of course. Yeah. Let me just interrupt. Singularities, this is goes back to Rima. In these kinds of issues, they're not bad things. They're often the landmarks you need to steer by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The formation of a singularity gives you a lot of information that may be more valuable as information than what the regular part of your differential equation mm. tells you. I mean, that's also part of Poincaré's qualitative conception. of it. Right, right. Mark, we'll take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk more about this. Okay. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, 
please reach out to info at scientificsense.com. So we are back. Uh, Mark, we were talking about uh, your book, Imitation of Rigor, um, which is based on a movie. Um, I don't know when the movie was released, but the movie was called Imitation of Life. Um, so what's the connection between the movie and the book? Well, in some sense, it's sort of specious yeah. because the, I have the most fun in doing my books in using Photoshop to make illustrations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what the what I've actually done is I paid Universal Pictures for the rights to the poster, but then I took off all, I relabeled it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So rather than starring Lana Turner, it stars Heinrich Hertz. <laughs> and, yeah. And rather than um, uh, Earl Grant singing Imitation of Life, I have Rudolph Carnap singing. <laughs> 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 something about rigor. Anyway, yeah. those are the little pleasures that get me by. <laughs> doing that. Right. So, but the, the, the connection is kind of specious. But I was talking to a friend of mine named Bob Pippin, who's at um, Ch University of Chicago. Yeah. He's just written a book about the Cirque, and we've been talking about it, about these themes in Cirque. And so imitation of rigor is meant to highlight a, a certain strand. Well, I would, I'm basically directed towards academic philosophers, but there are comparable um, folks everywhere in science or elsewhere that pride themselves in a certain sort of rigorous presentation, right? <laughs> Allied to giving an axiom system to clarify problems like we were talking about. Yeah. But in the cases I'm interested in, and, and, and it's lots of traditional philosophical problems strike me as, of this nature, but these problems that I saw back in Physics 101, the real philosophy needed to unravel them is sort of detective work of a much broader scale. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you've got to map out roughly what's going on there. What environmentally are these tactics responding to? What kind of recipe, what kind of strategy do they represent? And I think of that very much like you got a puzzling biological behavior. Why does a ruffled grouse do that weird mating dance? Well, sometimes you can figure out why that evolved. Sometimes it's a response to some environmental pressure that you would have never guessed until you looked into the matter. Okay. Yeah. So I think a lot of philosophy needs that sort of preliminary investigative work. And so I'm all for rigorous study, but you have to do that spade work first. That's what heavy side meant, you know. The first thing is to figure out what there is to find out is the way he said, or you have to get a rough sense of the territory in which you're working um, to understand some features of puzzling language or puzzling conceptual use. Yeah. So uh, anyway, I'm trying to yeah. alert yeah. philosophers to this broader way of thinking of rigor in a sense, but it can't, it can't be compartmentalized. Right. In the way they expect. So, so I was wondering, Mark, um, you know, do you see an issue with the education system? You know, it seems to me that science and philosophy uh, have sort of um, went on <laughs> uh, their own paths. And uh, your difficulty in Physics 101, uh, is it symptomatic uh, of of the sort of the education system where we yeah, uh, let me ask you differently do you think science, science students will benefit if they have a philosophy um, you know sort of a background 
Um, I'm not so sure. <laughs> I, I think that, like this discussion of Harris will interest some number of students that have been through similar things, you know. Yeah. And you find quotes, particularly from mathematicians hmm. who take a course in physics and cannot figure out why on earth are they doing that? <laughs> well, yes. that's a reaction that kind of comes from the same sort of background as I have, right? Hmm. So, and um, in fact, there's a really great book by Michael Spivak who wrote some famous books on differential geometry, but it's something on classical physics. And it's just full of why are they doing this? <laughs> and they're all reasonable questions, right? So for people that are alive to that sort of, the, mis the mysteries of the things that you learn to do with it, while feeling uncomfortable with them, uh, it may, to that sort of audience, it may appeal. But primarily I am focused on the other direction that philosophy has gotten detached from practicality, really. Of, of all sorts. And uh, there are many internal factors that promote that, not the least of which mm -hmm. is <laughs> the economic situation right now, where you're, yeah. Yeah. you're prompted to become a specialist quite early in your philosophical career. Now, sometimes in science, that's wise to do, but it's disaster for philosophy. Because yeah, I don't know. philosophy I don't does know. better having a wider range of experience. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, people will disagree with me. I don't know if it is wise to do in science either, because um, a lot of the in, in innovation today uh, really happens at the, at the intersection of disciplines. And so, so our, you know, sort of focus on specialization, because there's so much to learn in each specialization, and it become really deep and very narrow, very, very narrow. Um, it has some, some usefulness, but it, it is less useful from an innovation perspective. And if one believes innovation is, is really the, the most important thing, then, then we're, going to go, we're going to move away, uh, away from that idea. Well, I think that the, the whole story is more mixed than perhaps you're, because so a, a typical situation that you will see is that physicists will do something like Feynman and will be quite disdainful of the mathematicians because by fiddling around, you'll get some insight into something, right? <laughs> yeah. But the thing he fails to appreciate is when the applied mathematicians come along and try to make sense of it. And they need to do that to make the musings that Feynman have more applicable to realistic cases. And they, their studies and their rethinking of what on earth is going on here often are very profound contributions to our intellectual understanding. And mm -hmm. folks like Feynman sniff at them, but that's a improper way to view the, the value of systematic applied mathematics, right? So back on the philosophy technology side, from my perspective, yes, I agree with you that we need to have liberal thinking in every <laughs> department of life. But right now, my philosophy community has invented lots of excuses for not drawing on the well of the experience that I'm trying to highlight, which is these applied mathematicians mm -hmm. that are more systematic than the Feynman's, right? Mm -hmm. And um, but do in their own without trying to even be philosophical, discovered ways that things can piece together that systematically that I would have never dreamed of, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, I want to give praise to those guys as acting as philosophers in spite of themselves and hoping that professional philosophers can learn to imitate some of that. 
the, so, so the sounds like the imitation of rigor. The imitation of rigor. Uh, well, it has a different sense, but it's meant to get try to get philosophers to not have such staid conceptions of what conceptual progress is, and to appreciate these sorts of more technical or very closely detailed examinations are important sometimes. So. Yeah, it, it sounds to me, Mark, you need a new discipline, mathematical philosophy. Well, philosophy shouldn't, philosophy just is, philosophy should just be thinking about things that are puzzling, <laughs> right? So, in the, it, uh, you know, I'm not trying to define what philosophy is. However, I would agree with you. I think that philosophy, some department of philosophy needs to be a little bit less grand in its ambitions and more at attentive to detail. Mm -hmm. and, but the details of real human life, you know, there's a way in which some standards of logic, actually quite traditional standards of logic, smooth out thought patterns in an artificial way. And to really understand how we think productively, we've got to get past those smoothings out over. Yeah, sort, of thing, uh, sort of similar thing happened in economics too, Mark. Um, you know, the, a lot of the research in economics uh, at, the, at the very high level, um, doesn't really have much practical applications and um, practice of economics, you know, in, in a lot of universities um, is considered less, uh, less sexy in some ways. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I will occasionally teach elementary decision theory, which is, but I'll start with theory of gambling, you know, and I used to live in California and I'd go through Nevada every once in a while. I would make the mistake, I wouldn't advise it, of going to somebody feverishly working a slot machine and asking them, do you think it's rational? To... <laughs> <laughs> but it, um, the, the, I, I think it is fair to say, uh, in, in, in the little bit I do know about economics, I think what you're saying, it, you always have to be aware of the, the the way in which by turning something into the mathematics, you can bury some crucial detail that you don't expect is important, mm -hmm. but it actually comes back to bite you. And so it, you always have to be willing to look at the mathematics and say, what does this really mean? Am I coding something into it? Uh, or I miss, am I missing stuff? There's a lot of stuff just in physics like that. That's even in these things we've been talking about. There's a lot of missing physics in the background. Yeah. And yeah. it requires somebody to be able to spot that at some point. And so, um, of course, there has been a movement. To, yeah, you've got to make ec economics ultimately has to tie back to how people actually make decisions about money and stuff like that. <laughs> And, and there's a lot of interesting and unexpected things that come out when you examine things from that point of view. So. Yeah, I mean, we, we see this in all disciplines, I think, you know, um, confirmation and confirmation biases, right? So um, once you're in an academic environment, I'm, I'm just going to make a statement, you can correct me if, if this is not true. Um, you are sort of forced to conform to uh, to an expectation, to a template. Um, and anything peripheral, anything in the boundaries are actually less valuable um, for the academic, uh, you know, in, in uh, her own career, uh, research publications, whatever they may be. And so, so we, we have reached uh, what I would call sort of a templated uh, research and a templated education system. And uh, things that fall off from the template uh, are not really that valuable, typically. 
Well, I, I agree with that. And it, it, that's this, this, this little book of mine is trying to slow that or trying to resist that spe fake specialization tactic within philosophy where it's plainly doing no good. No. But it's very hard. I mean, all we have all these students, there are no jobs until money comes back into education. There are no jobs. And so when they come to graduate school, they're all, they look, they have to immediately uh, lay out a bunch of publications, which sort of marks them, as you say, as being in a particular pod. Yeah. And, but of all the disciplines in academics, philosophy is the one that should be the most exploratory. Hmm. By its very nature, it should try to keep track of more, these more general tendencies and then enter into dialogue. So I can't correct anything, any any economist in any material way, because I completely at sea with respect to anything having to do with money or society. Yeah. But I can yeah. warn them about these false models of what good science is. Yeah. And those false models, it's certainly true in economics, some of that does trace to these philosophy of science writers that I was talking about and their conceptions of what you need in a theory. Right. Now, I'm not anti-mathematical economics, and I understand why you want to explore some of these things, but you have to be open to uh, exploring other avenues at the same time. Right. right. So this book is in that spirit. So, so when you say philosophy needs, perhaps philosophy can benefit from applied mathematicians. Um, how do you see, if that were true, uh, how do you see that could, that could happen in the future? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I have not been able to uh, influence many of my colleagues much so I, yeah. because of these factors I'm talking about. Yeah, because people in are, are okay. So what I said that there are many innovations about how we describe the world that you see all over the place in productive applied mathematics. Yeah. Just trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, I'm not recommending it as a cure-all for all of philosophy but it gives you some particular models of open-mindedness you need when you think about how do we describe the world and not get locked into this, let's call it complete theory orientation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or there's a lot of philosophers that think that fall into the trap of, we got to prove theorems like they do in the sciences, right? Well, the ones that mm -hmm. philosophers prove are always trivial <laughs> or misleading, right? Any graduate student in physics or e economics could prove much better theorems in five minutes <laughs> because the philosophers lack that depth of training, right? So that's not where our forte should be. Our forte should be having a broader sense of history and the varieties of human thought, right? To keep us from getting lo locked into any narrow preconception of method or whatever. At least that's my way of thinking about it. Yeah. But then yeah. I'm kind of an anarchist compared to my <laughs> No, it is it is really interesting. Um I, I could see uh because I don't know anything about philosophy, I'm sort of attracted to it. Um I am attracted to the idea that you can just go out there and and uh, and explore. And from a naive perspective, uh, I look at philosophy as, as something that has no constraints. <laughs> you know, if I go into science or engineering or economics, it, the first thing I have to worry about is all the constraints that are already put in place. And my play field is highly restricted. Um, you know, uh, it, it's less interesting. Um, and so what, what you're arguing for, Mark, if I understand this, to, is to have um, the philosophy uh, play field 
to have a higher structure? To have more facts in it. <laughs> okay, so I, I think that probably some of those things that you thought were Uh, the sort of dogmatic specializations or so forth. Yeah. There's probably an underlying rationale for proceeding that way. That's probably rather imperfect, but it's still there. That's what I think is the answer to that physics training I was comparing. Hmm. So I would think that good philosophy could make some of these things that seem to you to be unreflective kind of can open up and to actual philosophy okay so my physics 101 instructors i just do your homework <laughs> but what he was he was trying to train me to do something that in retrospect uh, was learn how to manipulate data between two size scales yeah okay and i wasn't taught in my book that maybe you have to do structure your thinking like that to be productive okay hmm. and that tells you something about gee describing the world given its complexities are more complicated business than people that talk about trying to find the fundamental laws of the universe encourage okay so even in the narrowing of the fields that you may have experienced probably in some of that, those uh, compartment compartmentalization behind the slats yeah. in the pigeonholes, there's a lot of implicit philosophy. And I would like for professional philosophy to do a better job about ex 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 probing yeah. why are these slats here? Why do they seem to work and when do they fail? Yeah. You and, so let me ask you this, Mark. Um, I, I'll just uh, make a statement and we can debate it. So uh, as you mentioned, there are no jobs. Uh, we are entering a regime where um, the, the heuristics that we used to use in, in science and technology and economics and other areas uh, in terms of specialization and then so on um, are going to create outputs that are going to be less relevant for the future. Uh, we already endured that regime. We, you know, universities haven't really caught up with it, I would argue. Uh, and if that's the case, then, um, you know, in some sense, uh, what the technical fields need to do is to really broaden. But perhaps what you're saying is there has to be a meeting place. Philosophy has to come down a, a bit and uh, the technical fields have to go up a bit, and and both of those both of those could could benefit from doing that. Well, that's what I would like. I think we're faced with one world, you know, and ultimately, even the conceptions of fields depend upon assumptions about what we can, as human beings, do descriptively and practically within language and more emphasis on those sorts of problems i would recommend yeah 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 and so so in conclusion um mark so what's the what's one thought you want to leave uh, when is the book coming out well i have to finish the rewrite probably <laughs> early, early probably early next year early next year I, I i put in a lot of drawings so it takes longer the production time so <laughs> yeah, I I, uh, I enjoyed flipping through it. I didn't have have uh, enough flexibility to read through the entire thing, but uh, it, it it looks really interesting. So, if you want to leave one thought um, uh, for the uh, for the listeners, what would that be? You know, if you were to look forward, um, you talked about some of your ideas in philosophy; they could benefit from. Uh, some some general thoughts. Is there one thought you want to leave for the audience? Well, I have a bit of a problem here because philosophers want there to be some grand theme. Yeah. But at the highest level, my perspective is words do very funny things. Mm. 
in response to uh, developmental pressures, right? And so I'm more kind of like a biologist of the varieties of human innovation that we tend for the factors that you've been talking about to blur together as if they're doing the same thing. But I'm, I emphasize the diversity in tactics that work for different problems. Yeah, and, and don't take sort of the status quo is the, is the only way to think about it. Well, right, or th there's a lot more philosophy <laughs> Yeah. You know, those technical things than you think. Right, right. Excellent. And yeah. an applied mathematician should pride themselves as being a better philosopher than a lot of philosophers in some of the <laughs> innovative ways they've come to think about them. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks so much for spending time with me, Mark. I really enjoyed it. Okay. Thank you. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.